The first one of these is uh, Matthew 5, 31 through 32. And I meant to say that, but that's on page 10 of your pew Bible if you would like to use your pew Bible. Okay, so reading from God's word. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The second scripture, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Uh, for scripture and the fact that you've given it to us. So we have something we can use to understand you. Uh, we thank you for this time together to worship and praise you. We thank you for Scott, our great staff and volunteers. And we pray for Scott as he shares your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, we're in the second week of a sermon series called Surgery for the Soul. Because when it comes to our bodies, there can be things within us that are poisoning us, that are killing us, and a skilled surgeon can go in and can cut those things away so that we can have health. Now, I very much am not in the skilled surgeon category. I am maybe only a 50-50 player at operation at best. But we know that those skilled, that truly skilled doctors can go in and cut away these things that poison us to bring health to our bodies. And in the same way, we're looking to Jesus in these passages that he might cut into us and cut away the effects of dead religion and of shallow, shallow spirituality, that in him we could have true health in our souls. If you're looking for a topic where dead religion and shallow spirituality have, gro- uh, excuse me, have brought great pain and great hurt into the world, divorce is going to be one of the top ones. Dead religion, when it comes to divorce, can heap onto people great shame and great guilt and great accusation and great pain. And shallow spirituality can turn and look at something that's like a bomb that goes off in relationships and wounds people and treat it like it's something light and carefree and minimal. And because it's such a big deal, as we've been going through Mark, we saw in Mark chapter 10, Jesus asked about divorce and Jesus speaking about divorce. And we looked last week specifically at what he said in that passage in Mark chapter 10. But sometimes we come across a passage that touches on a topic so big that we can't do justice to what the passage itself says and to all the questions we might have about the topic in a single week. And so we say, we're gonna slow down and we're gonna take a week just to look at what else the Bible has to say about this topic. And that's where we find ourselves today. Last week we stopped, we looked at what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10. We saw why God is so passionate about marriage. We saw that he's passionate about bringing people together because together we have delight. And we saw that he's passionate passionate about marriage because marriage is actually part of his plan to look out for the poor and powerless in the world. So we saw all of that in the passage last week. But that passage raised questions for many of us that Jesus doesn't directly answer. And so this week, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take time to look at those questions. 
And the way we're gonna do it is like this. We're gonna almost break it down group by group and we're gonna say, what does the Bible have to say for these groups? And then what does the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, his message have to say for these groups? And so the, the plan is to look at five of them. We'll see how that goes. But the plan is to look at what do the Bible and what do the gospel have to say to those in troubled marriages, to those affected by infidelity, to those affected by abuse or neglect, to those desiring remarriage, and to those whose parents divorced. And if we have time, we may even ask, what does it have to say to the church in relationship to these areas? But we'll see. So we're going to be looking at these five groups and we're going to be really all over the Bible as we do so. So if you want to follow along in, your, in Bibles and you have one, I invite you grab it, open it up. We're going to begin in Matthew, but it's going to take us a minute to get there. If you would like to use a Bible and don't have one, you can grab one out of the seat backs in front of you. Or if you're using a smartphone or a tablet, whether you're here, whether you're listening in, you can have that ready as we're going to be surveying all of these different passages as we look at what the Bible and the gospel have to say to these groups. So let's jump in. First, what do the Bible and the gospel have to say to those in troubled marriages? Now, allow me to say, you already saw, we're going to talk about infidelity. We're going to talk about abuse and neglect shortly. So when we're saying troubled marriages here, we're talking about there's not necessarily abuse or neglect or infidelity, but there's great pain in the marriage. There's great distance in the marriage. There's great separation. It's just not a healthy marriage. And what the gospel has to say is that in Christ, there is the power to see that marriage transformed. Let me unpack why. See, if you've been in, could be a marriage relationship, but really any kind of relationship, you've probably encountered what one author calls the crazy cycle. You're going to see a picture of it behind me. And he talks about the crazy cycle in relationship to a man wanting respect, a woman wanting love. That may be helpful to some of you. Some of you may go, wait, doesn't the woman want respect? Doesn't the man want love? Don't get hung up on that part. Substitute anything you want into those placeholders, into those words. And see, what he's saying is this. Often in a relationship or in a marriage, you might have a husband who's going, my wife is driving me nuts because she's so needy. She wants so much from me. And the wife is saying, I can't stand my husband because he's so mean and he's so cold to me. And what happens is the husband goes, I want to be present to my wife. I want to be warm to my wife. But then she does something and it comes across to me like she's being needy. And so he responds in a way that she perceives as mean. And as a result, she then responds in a way that he perceives as needy. And you get stuck in this never-ending cycle. And you look at it and you go, well, the solution seems fairly simple. One of the two people needs to just change how they're responding. But the problem is to just change how we're responding cuts against our very nature. Maybe you felt that way. Well, I, I'd like to not be so mean, but if she just stopped being so needy, I wouldn't come across this way. Well, I'd like to not be so needy, but if he was just kind to me, I wouldn't have to be. And there's this fear that if we're the first ones to step out of the cycle, that the other person won't. And we'll get taken advantage of, and we'll get hurt, and we'll get run over. Game theorists actually talk about this in a slightly different way. They will talk about what they call a, a standoff, where they'll ask you to imagine three people standing kind of in a triangle, each one holding a gun pointed at the other. Now they say the win for everybody is if everybody puts the gun down and nobody gets shot. And so it should be pretty simple. Everybody just one, two, three, lower your weapons. But the problem is if you lower yours and the other people don't, you've lost all your leverage. You've lost all your power. And so game theorists will tell us that while what's best for the group is everyone to put them down, as we as humans think about this, we subconsciously realize what's best for me is if the other two guys drop their weapons, I have mine up, and then I can decide what to do. It cuts against our nature to simply step out of these vicious cycles that we get into in marriage, and these vicious cycles that would shipwreck and ruin a marriage. And so how does the gospel say to that your marriage can be transformed and made healthy? Here's why. Because the things we're looking for in these vicious cycles, they're the things that Jesus says he's going to provide. 
They're things that Jesus says, you can find these in me. And then because you found it in me, you don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to get it from your spouse because you've already got it from me. When you go to the grocery store, what's the easiest way to make sure you don't buy a bunch of food you don't need? Go with a full belly. At least that's what I've been told. I've never tried it myself. That's the idea here. If you're looking at your spouse and you're going, I'm so desperate for joy and they could be such a great source of joy, but they just aren't giving it to me. Or I so want to feel peace and security and yet they don't say those words. They don't take those actions that give me peace and security. If you're finding it robustly through God, you don't have to go, I'm upset at you because you're not providing it for me. You can go, I can now seek to meet your needs because I've been so thoroughly provided for by Christ. And that's what Christ promises. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, it says, he, though rich, became poor so that you, though poor, by his poverty might become rich. Do you hear what it's saying there? It's saying that what Christ is doing is that he, though filled with joy, became a man of sorrow so that you, through him, could have joy. He, though utterly secure at the right hand of God the Father, became one who was arrested and threatened and so anxious that blood came out of his sweat so that you could have utter peace through faith in him. One of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation put it this way. He said, when you pray to God, you can pray, quote, you have taken upon yourself what is mine and have given me what is yours. You have taken upon yourself what you were not and have given me what I was not. So what it's saying is in Christ, we have everything we need to step off of that vicious cycle. That in Christ, you can go to God and say, Lord, I can tell we're stuck in this cycle and it's not good for our marriage. Help me understand what I'm seeking from my spouse that I'm not finding that's keeping me on this cycle. And when you find it, you can then say, Lord, you've promised me all things in Christ. Come meet this need for me in Jesus. Fill me by the power of the Holy Spirit so that I would not have to look to my spouse to receive, but I could look to my spouse and say, how can I give? And as you do that, you step off that crazy cycle. You cause it to short circuit and self-destruct. And you see transformation come into your marriage by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what does the gospel have to say to those in a troubled marriage? It has to say by the power of the gospel, your marriage can be transformed by finding your all in all in Christ. So we see what it has to say to those in troubled marriages, but what do the Bible and what do the gospel have to say to those affected by infidelity? And we read one of the verses relating to that. We read in Matthew 5, 31 through 32, that Jesus says, It was also said in the Old Testament, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman makes her commit adultery. Now, what Jesus is saying here is that God's desire is to see marriages last. God's desire is to see marriages be transformed by the power of the gospel. But there are times when something comes into a marriage that's so toxic and destructive that it may appropriately cause that marriage to end. And he says in this passage that thing could be sexual immorality. Now, you may run into some who would actually reading this, they'd say, you know, the word here translated commits adultery. It's not the normal word for adultery. It's actually the Greek word pornea. And so that this isn't saying that infidelity in marriage could be a grounds for divorce, but only infidelity before marriage, that once somebody is married, you're just married. But that's not an interpretation that we can hold consistently with the Bible, because if that's true, then God himself has sinned. See, when God describes the people of Israel, he describes them as a bride in the Old Testament. He says it's like he has taken them to be his wife. And so with that in mind, when you read from the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 3, 8, you read these shocking words that God says, for all the adulteries of that faithless one, Israel, I sent her away with a decree of divorce. 
God says because of the infidelity of his people, he executed a divorce with the kingdom of Israel. And so when we read what Matthew is saying, if we can never, if divorce, or if, excuse me, if infidelity can never be a ground for divorce, then even God himself is outside of his own will. But that's not what we see here. We see Jesus saying, this can be something so toxic that it can break apart a marriage. Now, let's think through it on that. Because many in Jesus' day would say, anytime there's sexual immorality, that means there has to be a divorce. And Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say, yes, this has to happen. Jesus simply says, this can happen. And this is important for us because there can be a danger in looking at these that we come to them with a heart that says, well, when can I do this? When is this okay? Oh, that happened and now I have my grounds. And that's not God's heart at all. God desires reconciliation. God rejoices in reconciliation, even when there's infidelity, even when there's a breaking of trust and there's a bringing of tremendous pain into the marriage. But we also recognize that there are times when we interact with people where we desire to show grace and we desire to show mercy and be patient, yet we realize that we get to a point where we go, I'm enabling this person. By continuing to show grace and continuing to show mercy, what I'm actually doing is enabling this person in something terribly destructive. And so I now need to stop. I need to let them feel the consequences of what they're doing, not because I'm angry at them, not because I want to hurt them, but because I want them to feel what they're doing so they repent and they turn. And that's the heart of God. As you read through the whole Bible, that's how he interacts with his people. And as we look at what Jesus is saying here, that's a helpful way for us to think about this. If infidelity comes into a marriage you're a part of, that the response isn't, well, I just want away from this person. I want to hurt this person. It's, I want to see reconciliation, but I also recognize at some point I need to step back so I'm not enabling them. So that's what the Bible says to those affected by infidelity. But what about the gospel? What does the good news of Jesus say to those affected by infidelity? Hold that thought because it's such an important thing for us to answer. And it's something we're going to come to answer after we deal with the third group that we said we wanted to talk about. What about those affected by abuse or neglect? And this is the one. I was going to say this is the one that's hard. None of these are particularly easy. This is the one that's especially hard. And this is one where very godly, faithful followers of Christ who are very diligent in how they read the Bible actually come to different places. And so with that in mind, let's, let's kind of do a survey through the Bible of what Scripture says, and that may help us to think this through, help us to understand what God would say. See, in the book of Exodus, there's a law given about divorce. Now, in some ways, it's going to clarify things, and in some ways, it's going to muddle things even more, but we'll wade through that. You see, in Exodus 21, God is putting legislation around the practice of indentured servitude. As we read it together, you're going to see that it uses the language of slaves in Old Testament time. Indentured servitude is actually a better translation of what that practice was like. And it's talking specifically here, what happens if somebody has a woman who's working as an indentured servant to him and he chooses to marry that woman? And then what happens if he decides, oh, hey, there's another woman I'd like to marry and he marries her and now he has multiple wives. And what we're going to read in Exodus 21 is legislation God's putting around that. So before we read it, let's ask the question, does this mean God is supporting polygamy? Does this mean God is supporting individuals having multiple spouses? No, it does not mean that. If you read the Bible every time, every single time without exception, there is a story of polygamy. It always ends badly. Always. And we're meant to be able to read that as grownups and recognize when every time this is portrayed, it ends badly. It is God showing us this is not good. This is not what I desire. But we go, well, then why is God putting legislation around this practice? Because God recognizes that this is something human beings were doing. And he's trying to put legislation in place. They're going to protect people who fall under this practice, whether or not he says, don't do this. And so God is 
speaking Exodus 21 to protect those who would be exploited by this practice of polygamy. And this is what he says. It says, if he, a man who is married an indentured servant, if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. If he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Let's pick this apart. It's very possible that a man takes this servant to himself as a wife, but then he finds someone's better and he says, I'm going to marry her. And now this woman, I don't really have to feed her as much. I don't really have to provide for her. I'm going to sleep just with this woman. I'm, I'm not going to have any interactions with that woman over there. I'm not going to give her sons, which in this time and place for a woman having sons was so crucial and such a huge part of their identity and their life. And so God is saying, no, when you take somebody as your bride, he's saying this to the men, when you take somebody as your bride, you are committing that you are going to provide for them food, clothing, and what scholars will call in here conjugal rights. And that those are part and parcel of the marriage. And if as a husband you fail to provide those things, it says in verse 11, she shall go out for nothing. Now here's what that means. It means she's going to be released from the marriage and she's going to be able to go out. She's going to be able to separate from the husband and potentially be free to remarry as well. And then as history progresses and the people of God and the people of Israel move forward in history, this is something where as they saw it, how do we live out what the Bible says? They would say, well, we recognize that a marriage requires both partners to fulfill these three obligations, food, clothing, conjugal rights. One scholar summed it up this way, it requires them to provide physical support and physical affection. And if a spouse refuses to do this, then these could be grounds for that marriage being terminated. And we see this progress through the Old Testament. We, in fact, know it progresses through the Old Testament because when we get to the book of Ezekiel, we hear God through the prophet Ezekiel speaking to the people of Judah. And he's saying to the people of Judah, I separated, I gave a decree of divorce to the people of Israel. And here are the reasons why, and you're doing the same things they were doing. But listen to the reasons why God says that he divorced the kingdom of Israel. Number one, and, and why Judah would be at risk for this. He says, number one, Judah has committed adultery with other gods and did not love God. Ezekiel 16, 15 says to them, you trusted in your beauty and played the whore. So there you have the sexual infidelity. There you have the conjugal love, the physical affection. Then God says that Judah offered sacrifices to other gods. Ezekiel 16, 19. Also my bread that I gave you, I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey you set before them for a pleasing aroma, meaning you offered sacrifices of these things. What's God saying? As part of this covenant, you have provided food outside of that covenant. You haven't honored what a true spouse is supposed to do. And then finally, providing clothing. God says that Judah has decorated the idols and their temples with clothing and jewels. Ezekiel 16, 16 through 17. You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines and on them played the whore. You also took your beautiful jewels of gold and silver, which I had given you and made for yourself images of men and with them played the whore. Now, what's God saying? He's saying, again, clothing, sharing clothing with one another. That's supposed to be part of a marriage covenant. And instead you have chosen not to do that. And so when God, through the prophet Ezekiel, says to Judah, you failed to truly live as a true spouse, he names the same things listed in Exodus 21 and that the Jewish people had recognized as a part of faithful marriage. And so that takes us through the Old Testament, but then we get to the part where people really start to separate. We come back to that verse in Matthew with Jesus saying, everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And there's kind of two ways people fall on this. Some people who are very faithful, who take the Bible very seriously and study very well, they look at this and they say, what Jesus is saying there is, there is no grounds for divorce unless somebody in the marriage has committed sexual infidelity. And if that happens, there are grounds, but otherwise Jesus says, you know, unless that happens, there are no grounds. And so that's one place devoted followers of Christ land. 
Others will look at this and they will say, you know, it's very clear in Matthew 31 that Jesus is talking about a debate that rabbis were having over Deuteronomy 24.1. Now you'll see it up behind me. We're not gonna read through all of it, but it's a verse in the Old Testament that was very much debated in Jesus's time about whether it meant that a man could divorce his wife for anything or if it meant that a man could only divorce his wife for sexual unfaithfulness. And so they'll say, well, yeah, Jesus says that it's written you'll give her a certificate of divorce in Deuteronomy, but I say it's only if there's sexual unfaithfulness. He's weighing in on that debate. He's saying you can't just, that verse doesn't mean you can't just divorce a woman for anything. It only means if there's sexual unfaithfulness. But that Jesus and the other rabbis would have already had in the back of their minds that it would be accepted that if a spouse refused to provide physical support and physical affection, that those could be biblical grounds for divorce. And in fact, we know that the rabbis were talking about this because you can go through the Mishnah. The Mishnah is somebody went through and recorded all of the oral traditions the rabbis used. And there are discussions about how often a husband has to sleep with his wife if he's unemployed versus if he's a farmer versus if he's a traveling salesperson. And there's discussions about how much clothing, how much food has to be provided And so people will say, well, yeah, this was a huge debate in that day that everybody recognized that these were acceptable grounds for divorce. And so Jesus isn't speaking about that. He's speaking just about this interpretation. Here, they might give this example. They'll say, imagine you go home tonight and somebody sends you an email and say, hey, is it lawful for someone to drink? And you write back to them and you say, it's only lawful for someone to drink if they're at home with their parents or if they're over 21. And all of us in here understand we're talking about drinking alcohol. But what happens if somebody 750 years later finds your emails? They may go, wow, these guys were harsh. They didn't let anybody drink anything until they were 21. And they'd say, well, yeah, that's what's going on here. Everybody who would have read this in the first century would have known that. But because we're further removed, we don't immediately recognize it. But they'd say then, Because that was already accepted as grounds of divorce, we saw God use it as grounds of divorce, then things like abuse or neglect would fall under that and could be grounds for divorce. So we have these two camps. Let's start with what we can say together and then let's try to move forward from there. Because whenever you have godly people in different places, it's helpful to say, well, what things can we all land on together? Here's what we can all land on together. Everybody agrees that when divorce, or excuse me, when abuse or neglect is happening, this is an affront to God and it's wrong and it's something that breaks God's heart. It's sin and God detests it. And everybody agrees that if a spouse is going through abuse, that the spouse should get out of that situation, be moved to a different place. And whatever comes next, it should come next from a place where the spouse is safe and not placed in harm's way. Everybody can agree on that. And everybody agrees still that our desire is to see people come to repentance. And that means even abusers. And that's challenging in our day because our day actually very much likes judgment. We want the victims to be cared for and we want those who have perpetrated injustice to be oppressed. And then God shows up and says, I care for the victim and I care for the victimizer and I wanna see both come to repentance and be transformed. And so people who fall on both sides can agree with both of those things, but where do we go? And to be honest with you, I've wrestled with this. There's a part of me that it's like, it'd just be better to just not land and just be like, well, let's just figure it out as we go. And that is one thing everyone else can agree with is that any of these decisions should be made with prayer and fasting together. See, when it comes to a marriage racked by infidelity, a marriage racked by abuse or neglect or addiction, decisions should be made with others. Because here's the thing, we don't have a God who gives us a list of rules where we can just follow all the rules. We don't have the rabbis debating how often should a husband have sex with his wife to be in fulfillment of this command. No, what God gives us is his word, his spirit, and his people. And so it's together meditating on his word, praying and seeking his spirit with his people. We make some of these challenging decisions when we have to in our lives. But in terms of What does the Bible say to those affected by abuse or neglect? 
here's what I found from my study, here's where I finally landed, is that I would say that abuse and neglect fall under the failures to provide laid out in Exodus 21 and could be legitimate biblical grounds for divorce. And here's why I landed there. I did not land there easy. Here's what finally happened. I read 1 Corinthians 7.15. See, this is what 1 Corinthians 7.15 says. It says, if the unbelieving partner separates, and that word separates, it's the same one Jesus uses in Mark chapter 10 to speak of divorce. So we're not talking about two different things here. It's the same word. The unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. And this was very challenging because if Jesus says the only biblical grounds for divorce are sexual infidelity, how can the Apostle Paul, writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, then turn around and say, but also if someone initiates divorce with you, that's fine, just, just go with it. I mean, we would expect him to say, unless there's been infidelity, pursue this person, hunt this person down, restore the marriage, but he doesn't say that. Why wouldn't he say that? But if, as we've seen, it was already accepted that failure to provide physical support and physical affection could be grounds, then we could see how he could say that if a spouse abandons, that could be grounds for divorce because that abandonment would be that failure to provide. And so I saw that, but then what I saw that surprised me is these same criteria laid out in Exodus are things that Paul actually mentions as well in 1 Corinthians. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 through 4, he says this, he says, "'The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does.'" Exodus says that spouses owe each other physical affection, and Paul is saying, you know what? In marriage, you owe each other physical affection. And then we get 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 through 29. And he says this. He says, Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. This doesn't mean it's a lesser command. It means Paul's going, I don't have Jesus saying something explicit on this. But as one appointed to preach the gospel, applying the scriptures, this is what I would say. And he says in 26, I think in view of the present distress. Now, what is the present distress? Well, we know in 2 Corinthians, he's going to write of a famine that's starting to break out around the eastern half of the Mediterranean world. And if any of you have grown up in agricultural communities, you know this as I do. In an agricultural economy, when the farmers suffer, everyone suffers. And so there's an economic downturn happening. He says, in view of this present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Are you married? Don't seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Don't seek a wife. Now, why would he say that? Because we've already seen that when spouses come together, they're supposed to provide for each other economically. And if there's an economic downturn on, it could be that he's looking at this going, you know what, it's going to be really hard for you to fulfill your duty to provide for a wife, to provide for a husband. And so in light of the present crisis, it may be best to hold off until you're able to do that. What's important about that is it shows him applying all of the criteria of Exodus 21 after Jesus had spoken about adultery and about grounds for marriages terminating. And so as I read this and prayed on it and saw this, I went, Lord, it's not as clear as I would like, but it does seem that the direction of your Bible is that when there are those in relationships of abuse and in relationships of neglect, that there are biblical grounds for those marriages terminating. Again, as we talked about with infidelity, not as a, well, this happened once, let me step out of it, but no, instead as a, my heart is broken, but I recognize that continue on is to enable this person. And I need to make this decision because maybe, Lord willing, this is gonna be the thing that gets through to them, that they would change their behaviors. And so that's what the Bible says to it. But now let's go back because we've said, what does the gospel say to those who have been hurt by infidelity, what does the gospel say to those who have been hurt by abuse or neglect? And it says much. See, if you've experienced infidelity, then there can be this fear lurking in the back of your mind that 
because this happened, there must be something wrong with me. There must be something I wasn't able to give. There must be some way I'm deficient and therefore couldn't keep this person interested. And even though we might say, I know that's not true, it still pierces us to the heart. And to those fears, the gospel speaks Hebrews 2.11 that says, so now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Did you hear that? If you've been through infidelity and there's in you this lingering sense of there's something wrong with me, Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call you his. Let's flip it the other way and use the positive. Jesus Christ is proud to call you his as you are in him through faith. So if you've been through infidelity, when you feel that lingering, there's something wrong with me, I'm not lovable, I'm broken, flee to the promise of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call you his brother and sister as you are in him through faith. So that's those wracked by infidelity. What about those who have been through abuse and neglect? Well, one of the sad things I've found in ministry is often those who have been abused physically, sexually, however, come out of it feeling that they are in some way defiled, that they are in some way unclean. And you can say it wasn't your fault. You can say this this was the ownership of this other person, yet there's still this sense that I'm unclean. There's something wrong with me. And if that's where you are, hear the promise given in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, verse 11, that says to those in Christ, you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Hone in on that word, you were washed. If somebody walks into a house dirty and their friend sees them, they might think you're dirty, you smell bad, you're unclean, but after the person goes and takes a shower and comes down, they don't go, yeah, but you're still dirty. They go, oh, you washed, you're clean. If abuse and neglect has left you feeling defiled with the false belief that you are unclean, take hold of the promise Christ gives that through faith in him, you have been washed and any filth has been swept away in the cleansing flood of the blood of Jesus. But finally, what if you were the one who committed the infidelity? What if you were the one who was negligent or neglectful? What if you were the abuser? Hear the words of the New Testament book of Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Take hold of that. Through faith, you are crucified with Christ. Now, here's what happens when someone is crucified. They're not dead. They're dying. If through faith you are crucified with Christ, that means the Holy Spirit is putting to death your old self, the old self that would abuse, the old self that would commit infidelity. Now, God calls you to live into the new self and to live according to his ways. But if the guilt is overwhelming that I'm responsible for this, I did this, and yes, you need to repent to the person. You need to confess. You need to not excuse it. You need to just own it. And then you need to trust that through faith, Christ will put to death your old self and make you someone new. And so we see what the gospel has to say for those affected by infidelity, those affected by abuse or neglect. We're going to skip number four, but number five is important, so we're going to go there very quickly. What if you were a a child and your parents went through divorce? Because if that happened, it's easy to feel great pain of abandonment. It's easy to internalize it, to believe it's your fault. And the fear that can then come up that maintains through life is, you know what? I love this person. I care about that person. But the people who I love and who love me don't stick around. And so I can never truly trust anybody to faithfully be there. And if that's true, hear the promise that Christ or that God gives to his people in the Old Testament book of Isaiah when he says, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God. 
Here they're the promise that God is making when he says, if you are mine through faith, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you, but I will be with you always. So that when that feeling of, I'm afraid because those I love go away comes up, you can take hold of this promise and have assurance, but there's one who will never leave me and never abandon me. And so we see that for those wounded by divorce, The gospel gives tremendous good news. It gives promises that we can cling to. You know, Thomas Brooks, an old Puritan, said this of the promises of God, and it's helpful for us to hear as we consider how these promises speak to our pain. He said, now when any fears or darkness or doubts or disputes arise in your souls about our spiritual state, oh, then run to Christ in the promise and plead the promise and let your souls cleave close to the promise. For this is the way of ways to have your evidences cleared, your comforts restored, your peace maintained, your graces strengthened, and your assurance raised and confirmed. So as we look to what the Bible says about these issues of divorce, we look beyond it to what does the gospel say to those wounded by divorce, and we see the promises of God speaking a hope and a comfort to you. As he says, run to those promises, take hold of them, and pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart and give you the faith to believe them. And as you believe them in faith, to be transformed by the love of Christ. And we have the opportunity to not just hear that in words, but to celebrate that in action this morning. Because today we get to celebrate communion. Before Christ was taken to the cross, He broke bread with his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Take eat in remembrance of me. And he shared a cup with them and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Take this often in remembrance of me. And so as the worship team comes up and the communion servers come up, we have the opportunity to do just that. I invite you to come down the middle aisles or the outer aisles. In the center, there will be people serving at the outer aisles. You can serve yourself. There's also gluten-free options at the outer aisles. You can take the bread, dip it into the cup, and then I'm gonna invite you to go back to your seat. And as you sit, I'm gonna invite you to pray and ask God that as you take this tangible reminder that Christ would break his body for you, that the Holy Spirit would give you faith in the love of God poured out for you on the cross. It would give you faith to believe the promises when the pains of divorce or the pains of this world would speak a different message to you. If you're not a follower of Christ, I invite you to use this time to reflect, to meditate, to sing as well. Or if you desire to place your faith in Christ, to come forward, take the bread, take the cup as a sign that you do trust in Christ, you trust his promises and the power of God to make broken places whole. So at this time, I would invite you to stand, invite you to sing songs of praise to the Christ who gives his promises to heal us and to come forward as you are ready to receive his body and the cup of his blood.